The wife's typical boss orders a stand-in for her husband. Today's tale with a similar theme, relish it. You can exist for a prolonged period with the assurance that your life is progressing serenely and smoothly, and the only inconvenience in your life is a sluggish iPhone, indeed a charming wife, two delightful children, and solely bright prospects for a joyous old age ahead. However, everything can. Alter suddenly just once and you find yourself excluded from life's mainstream, or suddenly you find yourself walking in an entirely different path, and you are surrounded by entirely different people. I was born too early and my parents spent my whole childhood attempting to shield me from life's tempest. I ventured outside with the boys, always under the watch of one of them or my grandmother. My arriving home at strange hours was a catastrophe of global proportions. The boys in the neighborhood are always adept psychologists. They understand people well and know how to react to them. They understood me very well. Everyone, even the girls, made me feel terrible. It got so bad that I was scared to leave my house. When I did, a group of kids would bully me and it kept happening. I'd come home with cuts and bruises and my parents didn't know what to do. They tried talking to the other kids, but it made things worse. You can't always protect a teenager from tough situations by following them around all the time. My sad childhood felt like it would never end, and I'd always be stuck feeling small and scared. Then, one day, my mom's cousin Robbie came to visit. He was in military school and getting ready to join the army. He could see how tough things were for me. It was winter and kids were playing hockey in our yard, but I wasn't part of it. Robbie had noticed I was struggling, and one night he came to talk to me. He said that in life, people can be like predators, always trying to be the strongest. He told me that until I stood up for myself. Things wouldn't get better. He said being a man means having dignity, and I wasn't showing that. Now, but there's a chance to reclaim it. Don't fear pain, blood and tears. Consolidate your resolve into a fist and resist with honor. Let yourself lose, but your dignity will remain intact. Robbie patted my head, lit a cigarette, and exited the room. Two days later, I was inducted into the hockey team one of the boys fell ill, and I was tasked to substitute him. The game was intense. A three-man offense. Rolled out toward the goal. I executed a precise pass to my teammate on the stick, but he missed his chance to conclude the game in a tense moment. Of course, I was blamed for everything they insulted me with all sorts of names. And in the end, the unlucky player even struck me in the face. All the pent-up fury at one point overwhelmed me without a second thought. I struck the offender in the face with my stick. The guy collapsed on the ice like a wreck. He had his hands over his face, but was bleeding from the bridge of his nose. I grabbed the stick and looked around at the others. Everyone stood in silence until one of the guys said, It's your own fault, man. Elton had nothing to do with it. One evening, the mother of the person my son hit came to our house in a hurry, and my parents were shocked. They were relieved he didn't seriously hurt the person. Uncle Robbie made a grim joke about it. After that, everything changed for me. No one insulted or bullied me anymore. I felt like part of the group. I joined different activities, learned a bit of music, and played hockey. Uncle Robbie, who was in the army, took me to a martial arts class during one of his visits. He said I might not become a great athlete, but I'd learn to protect myself and others. That was the last time I saw him. Six months later, Uncle Robbie was killed in a dangerous place, and it was the first time I felt such a big loss. The classes I took helped me learn how to control myself. I wasn't just learning skills. I was making progress. I even started competing in national competitions, but that wasn't my main goal. I went to a technical university and, after five years, became a mechanical engineer. But I didn't want to work in a factory. I was inspired by stories of heroism in the military. In my third year of university, I met Sophie. She was a regular girl from a normal family, with blonde hair and brown eyes. 
She was dating one of my classmates, but when we met, it was like lightning. She broke off her engagement despite what her family and friends said. Six months later, we got married, and a year after that, we had twins, a boy named Robbie and a girl named Masha. I quickly got used to military life. I went to many dangerous places, even Africa, where I trained soldiers in artillery. I worked as a trainer for six months. One day, I got sick from drinking water I shouldn't have. I had hepatitis and had to go back home for treatment. I was in the hospital for a month, and my liver was really damaged. The doctor said I was lucky, but warned me about future problems. A year later, I got seriously hurt, so I had to stop serving in the military. I retired as a captain and had to adjust to civilian life. My wife was always there for me, even when I was in Africa. She never left my side, unlike some wives who take breaks from their husbands. I knew I had a loving woman waiting for me at home. As a civilian, I took some time to figure out what to do. Then I opened a shop where I fixed musical instruments and toys. It might not seem like much, but there's always a long line of people waiting for repairs. New instruments are expensive, but I offer affordable repairs. After two years, the shop became a company that made special guitars and luxury toys. Sophie worked as a doctor and made a lot of money at the regional diagnostic center. We had a big apartment in the city that my grandfather left us. And a big house in the countryside that we built ourselves. Our kids went to school, and everything was going well. Sophie was special because she looked young, even as she got older. Her face didn't have any wrinkles, and she had curly hair, a big chest, and long legs. She was my wife. But I started having a problem. I gained weight because of hepatitis, and my body got bigger. I lost the muscles in my stomach. It wouldn't have been a big deal. But I noticed that my wife started feeling uncomfortable around me. We still loved each other and spent a lot of time together, at work and on vacations. But there were parties for work lately, and people talked about them a lot. Sometimes my wife went to these parties with me, and sometimes she went alone. I didn't mind her having fun, but I started to notice strange looks from her co-workers. I didn't pay much attention to this, but subconsciously I became anxious. Something was happening behind my back. But what it was, I couldn't yet figure out. Gregor Rafe, a well-known businessman in our city, had been visiting my wife's office for some time. He had a solid reputation in the construction industry before he fell ill. Sophie was a cardiologist and successfully carried out a course of treatment. But the businessman was focused on his health and regularly sought to attend her appointments with bunches of flowers. One day I decided to meet Sophie after work, and as I was kissing my wife out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a businessman with flowers. However, he turned around in time and walked past U.S., pretending to be heading towards someone in the center. It did not escape my notice that Sophie blushed deeply and looked away. You know how blondes can blush. One evening at dinner, Sophie mentioned to me, Elton Gregory, you know him, is organizing a party. He wants to invite us casually. She said this as she poured me a coffee. What does that have to do with us? I grumbled and glanced at my wife. I was aware of her so far innocent relationship with Git Reef. I had even considered intervening their gentle friendship at one point. But for the moment, I decided to see what would unfold. I trusted my wife, especially since the businessman is not the only man around Sophie. There's no need to be jealous of every man around her. He wants to thank me for the successful treatment. Many famous people will be there, along with live music. We're invited. The party is on Friday, she said. Oh, and Sophie, I wanted to talk to you about Git Reef. It seems like he's trying to set you up with someone. It's like he's hunting you, even from someone looking from outside. You can tell he really wants to impress you. Doesn't it seem like he's just playing around? I put down my half-empty cup of coffee. Elton, there's nothing going on between us. Yes, he pays me some attention, but that's all she assured. 
Well, just remember, if anything more were to happen, it would be catastrophic for us. Elton, don't worry. I just want to go to the party, and I want you there too. I'm not planning to flirt with anyone, so if I blushed, and I thought to myself that Gregor might pursue you vigorously, can you imagine how things would turn out if he does? I observed Sophie's reaction carefully. After all, we are adults, we won't be there alone, and there will be security. I can handle myself. Don't be upset, my wife said, soothingly running her fingers over my cheek. In the end, I agreed. Sophie persuaded me, but my decision to attend wasn't because I gave in to my wife. I wanted to resolve things with Sophie and the businessman once and for all. The party was scheduled to start at 7 in the evening. Sophie was applying her makeup in front of the mirror. She looked like a model on the runway, her dark red almost burgundy. Dress was stunning to say the least. It subtly highlighted my wife's nearly perfect figure, showcasing her contours and curves precisely. I didn't understand why this upset me and nagging feeling had been bothering me for days. I wore plain black pants, a white shirt, and a velvet jacket. I thought about what shoes to wear for a bit and decided on black leather shoes with pointed toes. They weren't fancy, but they were practical. Sophie hugged me and kissed me on the lips. Do you think I look good? I asked sadly. You look amazing, she said, but I couldn't help wondering who she was dressing up for. For you, my love, only for you, she said. Let's forget about the party. We'll have a wonderful time at home. I was clutching at straws to delay what seemed like an inevitable disaster. Honey, we made a deal Sophie pouted. You look great too by the way I embrace my wife and she moved my hands from her shoulders and looked at me reproachfully. Elton you'll wrinkle the dress I realized that in her mind she was already at the party. For a moment I believed I was bidding farewell to my wife. I grasped her by the arm and escorted her to the door. As I was making my way to the car I managed to flick the light switch with my left foot position just above my head without altering my stance. Motions evaporated instantly and I was prepared. We reached almost punctually the gate was open allowing us to drive unhindered to the parking area in front of the house. The valet approached quickly, but I did not entrust him with my vehicle. Instead he pointed out the vacant spots. Without hesitating I chose the last one to ensure an easy exit from the garage if needed. I operated purely on instinct. My unconscious mind and my not yet fully diminished military training served me well. I handed the valet some money and requested they not block my car, leaving a clear path. Sophie watched my actions with astonishment and worry. What's all this for? It seems like you're preparing for something terrible. Hey, calm down. Everything will be okay. I told my wife. But I didn't really believe it. I just shrugged. It's just a small precaution. We'll see how things go, I said vaguely. The important thing is that this party won't ruin our marriage. My wife's face went pale. It seemed like she knew something bad was about to happen. But what? Oh no, it's starting to go wrong already, I thought. But maybe it's not all bad yet. We walked up the steps to the front entrance. Just before we reached the door, Sophie turned to me. Elton, let's enjoy ourselves today. We don't want any problems. Let's relax and have a good time with nice company and good music. The door opened, and a young man asked for our last names. I told him our names. He scanned the guest list for a while before saying, Sophie Vires and a guest his gaze shifted to me with a slight sneer. Two people, please come in. Gentlemen, have a delightful evening. I looked at my wife taken aback by with a guest like an unintended addition. A cold fury welled up inside me. Sophie gave me a strange look and squeezed my hand reassuringly as we entered. From the corner of my eye, I noticed a disdainful smirk on the lips of the guard at the entrance to the hall. We were greeted by Mr. Gary himself who was accompanied by a young woman in a very short green dress. 
Her cropped black hair elegantly framed her tan face and she exuded an aura of costly perfume. The host kissed my wife's hand. You are a miracle worker. I am speechless then turned to me. You must be Elton. I've heard so much about you. Pleased to meet you. To you I am just Boris he extended his hand. I accepted it and he began to squeeze. I reciprocated firmly, licking him in the eyes. I could tell he was in discomfort and was struggling to conceal it. That was enough of a hello. I relaxed my grip. There was a short pause. Then Boris smiled and greeted us saying, Come in, friends. Make yourselves comfortable and chat with our other guests. He didn't introduce the person with him. Many people had already arrived, including some athletes and their partners, a couple of actors from a nearby theater, and some attractive women. Someone from the mayor's office was there too. I didn't know the others and honestly, I didn't want to. I had other things on my mind. Sophie kissed me on the cheek and hurried off to the bathroom. I meandered near the buffet table, clutching a glass of soda. I took a slow sip, scanning the room. I had no intention of drinking alcohol that evening. I saw Sophie re-enter the hall. Boris approached her, taking her by the elbow. Sophie turned to him with a smile. Then she whispered something to him that made him shake his head in discomfort. He glanced around, saw his companion, and dismissed her with a wave. Someone placed their hand on my shoulder. I spun around to see the friend of the owner with a charming smile gazing at me. My name is Stella. Bring me some champagne. She requested. Indeed, she was quite attractive, though not as much as Sophie. I grabbed a champagne flute from the table and handed it to her. You're amazing. She exclaimed. Honestly, I wasn't in the mood for flirting today, so I merely mumbled the first thing that popped into my head. It was poorly tongued. Her approach. Wayne and I realized as I saw Boris signaling to her. Okay, I understand, I thought. This woman appeared to be designated for me, ensuring I kept out of trouble that night. We chatted briefly, discussing trivial matters. She watched me intently. She looked at me intensely, showing she wanted more than just talking. I kept watching my wife while Stella talked to me. Sophie and the host were dancing and then went to the bar. Another couple I didn't know came up to Sophie, who seemed to be having a great time. She forgot she came with me. I see you're watching your wife, Stella said with a smirk. Don't worry about her. She's busy tonight, and Boris will keep her entertained. Look at me. I'm here for you. I wasn't surprised and just looked at Stella with a cold, unfriendly look. She shivered, seeming like she didn't care about romance. Probably not tonight, I thought as she quickly moved away and disappeared. I looked back at Sophie. She was dancing closely with Boris in a slow dance. There weren't many people on the dance floor, just two other couples. A small band was playing, and there was another couple nearby who I didn't know, being affectionate. My wife and the businessman were acting cozy, with him whispering in her ear and her leaning into him. It was clear Sophie was really into it, letting Boris hold her close and kiss her openly. I could tell Sophie didn't realize what she was doing. I knew it was time to step in, so I went on to the dance floor. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw two big guards coming towards us. I tapped Boris on the shoulder. He got annoyed but didn't let go of my wife. Go away, you fool. Sophie is with me tonight, he said. Uncle, don't get confused. She's my wife, so leave her alone, I said firmly. Boris held on to Sophie's hand and signaled to his guards. They came closer. I looked at my wife. She didn't try to let go of her new boyfriend's hand. You tricked me. We're leaving, I said firmly, if you stay. I didn't need any more hints. I knew what was coming next. I was angry and needed to blame someone. Elton, please. It's just one night, Sophie begged, 
almost in tears. You want to sleep with him so badly you're willing to forget about me. I nearly shouted. The music ceased and my words echoed through the room. The owner, seeing my anger, realized it was. Time to silence the stubborn fool who refused to let his wife be taken by the Alpha. He gestured dismissively at the guards. Elton, you could have enjoyed your time with Stella, and I could have too. I don't understand your refusal you liked her, didn't you? Sophie sobbed quietly. The jealous husband ruined the evening. Get that cuckled out of here now, Gregory bellowed, no longer concealing his anger. They advanced on me from both sides. I waited, my eyes fixed on my wife. The guards grabbed me, attempting to twist my arms, motionless, then hid behind Gregory's back. It seemed she no longer saw me as her husband. I struck the left guard with my heel on the leg, then quickly turned, freeing my left hand and striking the second one in the throat with my knuckles, and did the same to the first. They fell like timber, making a distinctive sound as their head struck the dance floor. Now nothing held me back. Now everything was clear. I no longer had a wife. Boris came at me, but I saw fear in his eyes. I stepped toward him and smirked. I kicked him in the groin with my boot and then jumped up, hitting him in the chin with my heel. He fell down fast. It happened so quickly that nobody, absolutely nobody, understood what was going on. Boris tried to get up, shaking his head. I walked towards him with my fists clenched. Suddenly, Sophie shouted, Alton. Stop. You'll hurt him. Someone else yelled. Call the police. I watched as my wife tried to help her boyfriend. You're terrible. How could you? She yelled angrily, struggling to find the right words. I'm leaving. Are you coming? I asked firmly. Get out. I'm disgusted by you, she confirmed. That was all I needed to hear. I looked back at the scene once more and left the house quickly. No one stopped me. I walked out to the parking lot. It was dark already. I sat down tiredly in the driver's seat and turned the key. The engine started loudly, like a big, well-fed cat. I left the parking lot carefully, looking back briefly as if I expected to see a sorry Sophie in the mirror. Then I gently pushed the gas pedal and drove out through the gate. One thing was sure after I kicked him. That guy wouldn't bother my wife again. I took out my phone and called a familiar number. They picked up right away, like they were waiting for my call. How did it go? Asked C.A.T., my friend. Not great, I said. I opened the glove compartment and grabbed a pack of cigarettes. I hope you didn't go too far, they said with a laugh. I chuckled and lit a cigarette. No, everything's okay, I said. Do you need any help? They asked. Not sure yet. Let's keep in touch, I said, and hung up quickly. My car sped toward the city. I decided to spend the night in my city apartment. It hurt to return to the place where it all began. The apartment was adorned with various artworks, landscapes, portraits, still lives, and genre scenes. I didn't know the names of the artists. My grandfather was passionate about painting and only he knew which artists had contributed to his collection. This apartment was redolent of my childhood. I often visited my grandfather and stayed overnight. It smelled of cigars and the smoke from a burning fireplace. Here in this old house I wanted to spend some time reflecting on the recent events. I lit the fireplace, even though it was early autumn and warm enough. I just wanted a moment to remember my childhood and the past. I poured myself some Irish whiskey and sat in my grandfather's chair, with my legs stretched out toward the fire. I didn't realize when I fell asleep. The doorbell rang at 3 a.m. Without taking off my blanket or putting on my slippers, I went to the door. I opened it and saw Sophie. She had tears running down her red, swollen eyes. She looked as bad as I felt. Elton, I knew you'd be here. Never in my life have I messed up so. 
Badly. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Never again. I don't want to lose you, she sobbed, lowering her head. We had separated after Boris was taken away by ambulance. I shrugged. Well, at least that's some good news. Sophie, what did you expect would happen when you allowed that fool to spend a night with you? Did you think I wouldn't anticipate it because of Stella? I was a fool. A narcissistic idiot. Tell me, did you and Gregor Reeves orchestrate this entire ordeal? Did you know in advance what was going to occur at the gathering? She gazed downward. Not everything. Only broadly. He implied that once we arrived, we might exchange roles. But I assumed I would refuse. And that would conclude the matter. However, you didn't refuse. You agreed. I assumed you were going to remain with Stella. I noticed how she looked at you. It was just one evening. What about afterwards? Did you really think we could go on like normal when we both knew you were with another man? How can I trust you now? We stood in the doorway. I didn't let her inside. I get why you thought Stella would come after me that night. But why did you pick this stranger over me? She didn't say anything. Sophie, just go. I don't have a wife anymore. You betrayed me with that guy. He's not my guy, she started to say. But I shut the door quietly. She stayed at the door for a bit. Then I heard her heels as she left. On Tuesday, an older man came into my office. Mr. Elton Vickers, he said, looking at me over his glasses. Yes, what can I do for you, I asked. I'm D. Rosa Rista, he said. May I sit down? I took out a cigar and started to cut it. Mr. Gregory wants to sue you for the injuries you caused last Friday night. Where did he find that lawyer? He should be a doorman, not a lawyer, I thought. And why hasn't Mr. Gregory done it himself? I lit my cigar and started to smoke. The unexpected visitor grimaced before he puts you behind bars and ruins your enterprise. Gary is willing to overlook the altercation if your wife spends this weekend with him at his estate. The attorney even blushed at such a proposition. Even that fool in a blue suit knew that no sane man would accept that. And why have you come to me? Go to my ex-wife and negotiate with her. After all, after all, after the last party, it's her issue. It's not as if your boss is asking me to spend the night with him. I clamped my cigar between my teeth and stood up, indicating that we had nothing further to discuss. The lawyer rose and left my office silently. I looked at myself in the mirror with a cigar in my mouth, feeling a bit like Schwarzenegger, but a little heavier. I sat quietly for a while, then took out my phone. A day later, an old car stopped outside G. Reese Businessman's mansion. Two men in orange uniforms came up to the gate. Gas emergency. There's a big leak in your area. We're checking all the properties, the guard told the taller man. The guard talked on the phone for a while. The gas man went down to the basement where the gas boiler was. One of them took out a small can from his pocket. There's a strong smell of gas here. There seems to be a leak down here somewhere, remarked the tall man as he placed his case on the floor. Do you smell gas? The gas man began examining the meter. When did you last replace the pipes? Asked the shorter one. The guard shrugged. Okay, we will now shut the valve and fix the leak, but we also need to replace the infrastructure. Inform the landlord, it must be done promptly. The shorter man began extracting his tools from his suitcase. The taller one, shielding the pipe with his back, wrapped a small amount of special ignition cord around it and inserted a three-hour pencil cap in it. Then he carefully wrapped the entire thing with tar tape. The little one rummaged beneath, quietly opening the valve. Well, that's it, he said, though he did not specify further. Sound the alarm. The team grabbed their tools and quickly headed to the exit. The security guard firmly shut the doors to the basement. Three hours later, 
an explosion caused by a gas leak in the basement ignited a fire. By the time rescuers arrived, the building had almost entirely burned down. Fortunately, no lives were lost. Several security guards and the cook sustained minor burns. His warehouse of finished products was ablaze. Apart from construction, Mr. Ga also made custom furniture for special orders, but everything he prepared to send to customers got destroyed. The investigation found out that old wiring had caused a short circuit. To relax, the businessmen hurried to Thailand for a special massage. But at the Bangkok airport, they found pills in his luggage. Now he's in a detention center, waiting for his trial. We don't know what will happen to him yet. I live alone in my apartment. Sophie keeps trying to make up with me, but I can't forgive her. I still remember her mean words. Get out, you make me sick. Oh, and I also donated some money to the Wild Geese Special Forces Veterans Club, where I've been a member for almost 10 years, but I haven't told anyone. You should keep it a secret too.